Sault Ste. Marie, known as the nerve center of northern Ontario, is a city boasting one of the largest steel mills in Canada, the Great Lakes Power Company and Abitibi, at one time a major contributor internationally of pulp and paper products. This city reaches out via the Algoma Central Railway, the Trans-Canada Highway, and the International Bridge to tie in with the rest of Canada and the United States. It was once believed that Sault Ste. Marie, now hosting a population of 82,000, would expand no farther than any of its outlying communities. One man opened avenues of development across the north, realizing this area as one of unlimited opportunity. Francis H. Clerg. Francis Hector Clerg was born in 1856 in the state of Maine. His Huguenot ancestry, combined with a New England upbringing, should have developed a cautious, conservative, frugal type of man. Instead, this unlikely source produced an entrepreneur whose meteoric career shook the financial capitals of the world and changed a sleepy little town into an industrial center. Clerg was trained as a lawyer and was admitted to the bar at the age of 20. However, it soon became evident that his talents lay in the promotion of large enterprises. After the successful promotion of the first Electric Street Railway in Maine at Bangor, his following often grandiose schemes met with varying success. They included power canals, pulp mills, railroads, steamships, even a bank. Some were outstanding failures. Soon he found that he was no longer appreciated in Maine, so he moved to Philadelphia, where he found employment with a group of financiers who sent him out to find water power that could be developed and the energy sold. In his travels up the Great Lakes system in 1894, he found what he was looking for at Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. The population stood at 2,130 in 1894, large enough to claim town status. However, it was known simply as a supply junction and contained no major industry. The Sioux supplied fuel in the form of wood to lake freighters traveling the St. Mary's River system. Other minor occupations included fishing, farming, and lumbering. In the late 1800s, railway lines were creeping across this nation. With the completion of the Canadian Pacific Railway to Sault Ste. Marie in 1887, the town experienced a brief period of growth and prosperity. A man by the name of W.H. Plummer was mayor and a leading politician. He owned much of the land near the waterfront as well as the docking place for any ships traversing the local waterway. His general store, located beside the Algonquin Hotel, supplied merchandise and goods for the townspeople. The land he occupied was called Plummer's Corner, while his home, Lynnhurst, became the social center of the city. Lynnhurst was later donated by Plummer to the city to be used as a hospital. Even today, the man remains well remembered. The Plummer Memorial Public Hospital stands named in his honor. The Precious Blood Cathedral, which still stands today, dominated the surrounding stores and houses. The main street was narrow, but did boast wooden sidewalks, a reminder of the short economic boom. The Bank of Commerce, located on the main street, is now the site of Muyo's restaurant. Sault Ste. Marie was typical of an early town in that hotels prevailed throughout. The Victoria Hotel was one of many frequented by lumberjacks, the International on the corner of Bruce and Queen and the Algonquin. Sir Wilfrid Laurier, elected Prime Minister of Canada in 1896, visited the Sioux in that year and stayed in the Algonquin Hotel. Colonel John Prince, the first Sault Ste. Marie magistrate, owned several acres of land along the waterfront and called it Bellevue. Today, it is the site of Bellevue Park. Shinwalk Hall, built in 1874. It was the first local school for Indian children. The Ermatinger residence, or Old Stone House, was the sheriff's home, as well as being the local courthouse and jail. Various meetings, including city business, were conducted within its stone walls. By 1894, Bishophurst, the residence of the Anglican Bishop of Algoma, was already 24 years old. 
The first customs officer, Joseph Wilson, founded the Mountain Battery, or local militia. His aunt's name lived on through his home, which he called Marchbank. In later years, the street on which his home stood was named March Street. It is now a thriving business section. In 1889, in the heady atmosphere of prosperity, brought on by the building of the CPR to the Sioux and the construction of the ship canal, a group of local businessmen joined together to build a power canal. Soon it became apparent that they lacked sufficient money and the project was taken over by the town. But even it was too much for the little town. And when one of the canal banks collapsed, the project failed and the town was left with a debt of $263,000. It was this partially collapsed canal that attracted Clerg's interest. With Lake Superior as a mill pond, it had obvious, unlimited potential to Clerg's educated eye. All that was lacking was the large financial vacuum which he knew he could supply. In return for assuming the town's debt for work already done, he was able to obtain conditional title to the canal and the adjoining property, which included the old Hudson Bay Company post. He also agreed to supply for a fixed sum water and light to the municipality for fire service and street lighting, and also to domestic users of both. With his conditional title in his pocket, Clerg met with his backers in Philadelphia and convinced them to buy the scheme. As in Bangor, he once more proved that he was, quote, the greatest word painter in the line of modern promoters, unquote. Returning to the Sioux, Clerg immediately began to enlarge the little canal to 20,000 horsepower capacity, and he established the Togona Water and Light Company to supply water and light to the town and its residents, as he had agreed to do. Then, with interesting sympathy with the past, he built his home beside the canal, on the walls of the old Hudson Bay Company powder magazine. Clerk's Blockhouse is still there today. Clerk noticed the great forests which dominated northern Ontario. With this in mind, he undertook the building of a pulp and paper mill and located it beside the power canal, by 1896, the pulp and paper mill in Sault Ste. Marie had been completed and within four years was churning out 150 tons of ground wood daily. Spruce wood, abundant in the north, was implemented for the pulp wood produce. When Clerk first utilized the accessible wood in the late 1800s, he faced almost insurmountable difficulties. Foreign markets were undercutting the price of his pulp products, while the American dealers set their own price for the purchase of the Canadian product. Clerk found that operating costs for his plant were almost equal to one twice its size and therefore could not compete with other markets. Although 150 tons daily was an impressive figure, it was only about 45% actual pulpwood. At that time, no method had been devised to extract the water from the final product. This meant Clerg's product, shipped with its 55% water content, was costing more than double its value. The company began to lose money as well as its accessibility to foreign markets because of shipping costs. Clerg, realizing the importance of the pulp and paper mill and its ultimate benefits, determined to find a way of reducing the water count in the pulpwood product. Clerg inquired in the United States and throughout Europe for plans of such a machine. However, the idea was thought an impractical venture and so had not been attempted. Undaunted, Clerg designed his own pulp drying machine and then looked for someone to build his invention. Stumped again, he was forced to construct his own machine shop to build his pulp wood drying machine. It took an investment of $125,000 before the first machine was completed. And it was six months following completion of the machine shop and the pulp wood drying machine before one sheet of dry pulp was produced. However, Clerg had won. His insight had produced a new field in pulp and paper. Now, foreign markets from every part of the world clamored for Sault Ste. Marie pulp. The pulp and paper mill in the Sioux began to grow and thrive. The Sioux was coming into its own with industry following industry, and the sleepy little town, led by an American and his dream, prospered. Still, Clerg kept building. The next logical step was the production of sulfite pulp, so he built a sulfite pulp mill. Since quantities of sulfuric acid are required in the production of this better grade pulp, he looked for a supply of sulfur. 
The closest source was Sudbury, where sulfur was a byproduct in the production of nickel. When the Canadian Copper Company, a forerunner of international nickel, refused to supply him sulfur, he bought two nickel properties, which he named the Gertrude and Elsie Mines, after two of his sisters. To get the production of these mines to the Sioux, he purchased the charter of the Manitoulin and North Shore Railway and built the railroad from the mines to the CPR line to the Sioux. And then he built his sulfurous acid plant close to the sulfite mill. But now he had a nickel iron byproduct from his sulfur production. So he built a reduction works and a ferro-nickel plant to manufacture nickel steel, which he sold to Krupp of Germany. And since alkalis were needed in these plants, an alkali plant was built, and the chlorine byproduct was used as a bleach for the sulfite pulp. So now everything was settled with no loose ends. Then one day, a prospector named Ben Boyer came to Clerg with a sack full of samples and a very interesting story. I was on top of what seemed to be a mountain. Across the lake was a swath of brownish red that ran from the water's edge to the top of the cliff. I had found a vein 300 feet wide and 100 feet high from the water edge. Ben Boyer had discovered what was to become the largest iron ore producing area in the province. It held an estimated 30 million tons of ore. Clerg purchased the mine near Mishapu Cotton and named it the Helen Mine after his sister. The year was 1897, and the price of Boyer's find was only $500. By 1909, the mine was producing between 900 and 1,000 tons of iron ore per day. The Grace Gold Mine, also discovered in 1897, was another successful venture of Clerks. Located in Mishapu Cotton, it proved beneficial for that area. However, Clerg was uninterested in gold and concentrated his efforts on the iron ore mine in Mishapu Cotton. Clerg built a 12-mile railway to transport his ore out of Mishapu Cotton. Clerg's railway, a 12-mile stretch from the Helen Mine to Mishapu Cotton Harbor, was built according to the Clerg standard, nothing but the best. The road was laid with 85-pound rails where 70-pound ones would do. Cars were 55 to 60 tons capacity, two to three times larger than many southern railway cars. The locomotive was massive, weighing 40 tons. Clerg also purchased four freighters from Europe to ship Mishapu cotton ore to other markets. The ships were of the latest European design and held a maximum of 2,500 tons. His company built a hotel, a sawmill, small but efficient the iron ore mine, which produced 50,000 tons per season, and the docks where the freighters loaded. He owned 11 boats altogether, three passenger vessels, one tug, and three barges. The four European freighters carried ore and rails. Three of the freighters eventually met their fate on Lake Superior. The Theano and the Monk's Haven sank without casualties. The Lee Field went down with all hands. Ironically, these vessels were lost on Superior within a 60-mile radius of each other. The Paliki was the only one to return to salt water. Clerg's now widespread mining and industrial ventures obviously had to be tied together in a neater package. And what better way than with a railroad? He already had the charter of a railroad and had used it to push track north from the Sioux to tap the forest resources of the area. It was natural to tie it in with the Mishapakotten Helen Mine Line and perhaps even go on to Hudson Bay. But railroads are extremely expensive to build and governments often give grants when new territory can be opened up. Kirk decided to look for support to help him convince the provincial government. The most influential group in the province was the Toronto Board of Trade and Clerg let it be known that he was available to speak to them and received an invitation to do so. To assure greater coverage, he arranged to have the speech covered by the Toronto Globe and is said to have paid to have the entire speech printed in the paper. Once again, he proved that he was the greatest word painter when after leaving his private car on the railroad siding, he addressed the Toronto Board of Trade. I am a backwoodsman from the wilds of Algoma. And I suppose that these gentlemen here view Algoma as an unknown country, or one barren and deserted. That is the way Algoma looked to me, coming
coming from the eastern section of the country and originally from the United States. However, there has been an evolution in industry in Algoma, and I shall portray to you this very peculiar and unique evolution from the falling waters there, and following all through until you reach the climax, which has not been accomplished, but which we are still aiming at. Clerg spoke for almost one hour to an enthusiastic audience. They were sold, they spread the word, the government came through with large money and land grants, and the Algoma Central and Hudson Bay Railway began to press northward into the wilderness. In just six years, Clerg had accomplished more than many men would in the space of a lifetime. His reasoning for so vast an undertaking was misinterpreted. He did not look for power or money. His goal was to harness the almost unlimited opportunities which lay in the North. When Clerg arrived in 1894, it took only two years for the pulp and paper mill in Sault Ste. Marie to become recognized internationally for its products. He invented a pulp drying machine and constructed the machine shop to build it. At the same time, he undertook the rebuilding of the water power canal on the St. Mary's River system and increased its capacity to 20,000 horsepower. In a speech to the Toronto Board of Trade in 1900, Clerg convinced them of the need for railways in northern Ontario. Shortly following this, work commenced on the Algoma Central Railway to connect it with the transcontinental railways and tie it in with the Mishapakotten 12-mile spur already completed. The Helen Mine in Mishapakotten was in itself a feat to be admired. Its daily iron ore production during the shipping season made it one of the largest and most productive in the province. On the Great Lakes, Clerg's company owned four freighters to carry the many products to other markets, thus opening up another means of transportation out of the north. He took a little unknown area and built it up to become one of the most productive of its time. When Clerg arrived in 1894, the population stood at a scattered 2,000. By 1902, the population was a thriving 30,000 persons. It was predicted that by 1905, the numbers would rise to 50,000. More enthusiastic citizens expected as many as 200,000 to populate Sault Ste. Marie. Clerg still had a few loose ends to tidy up. He had a producing iron ore mine and in the ferro-nickel works, the nucleus of a steel mill. And he had a railroad to build. It was apparent that the next major undertaking should be a Bessemer steel works and a rail mill. Two blast furnaces were built, one to use coke, the other to use charcoal. Charcoal kilns were built at the steel mill and at advantageous points along the railroad. A byproducts plant was built and acetate of lime and wood alcohol were produced from the manufacturer of charcoal. Huge coal and ore docks were built beside the steel works. But construction was delayed time and time and again when materials were not delivered when needed. Even so, the first rail was rolled on May 3, 1902, but from purchased pig iron. While all of these things were happening on the Canadian side of the river, Clerg had been busy building a power canal on the American side. It was, next to the railroad, the largest single undertaking of the company. The canal he dug was over two miles long. 200 feet wide and 22 feet deep. The powerhouse, over a quarter of a mile long, designed to produce 60,000 horsepower. For the opening of the plant, Clerk provided special trains to bring prospective investors at the company's expense from New York, Philadelphia, Detroit, Toronto, and Montreal. And the entire second floor of the powerhouse was decorated for the party. Food-laden tables ran the length of the building, and the Calumet and Heckler Band, said to be one of the finest in the country, entertained the guests. Industries, stores, and schools on both sides of the river closed for the celebration. A mammoth parade entertained the people by day, and fireworks amused them by night. It was an extravagant display designed to attract new capital. When it was all over and the costs were calculated, it was found that over $100,000 had been spent on the party more than 50,000 of it on brass bands and fireworks alone. The construction of the steel plant resulted in two separate communities in Sault Ste. Marie, 
Taguna village, built and owned by the Clerg Allied Company, housed steelworkers only and was directly responsible for another community, Steelton, to spring up beside it. Both Tagona Village and Steelton were built by 1902 and 10 years later were amalgamated to the city of Sault Ste. Marie. Clerg's driving nature was not satisfied with only the steel plant and in one year alone, 1902, he undertook seven other ventures. Clerg bought the International Hotel, a massive structure of 225 rooms. In 1902, Clerg purchased a sawmill from Bay City, Michigan, and located it in Sault Ste. Marie beside the Algoma Steel Corporation. He went on to build a veneer mill next to the sawmill. The construction of street railways, not only in Sioux, Canada, but also in Sioux, Michigan, was visible proof of the industrial boom in both Sioux. A more adventurous endeavor was the power canal and powerhouse in Sioux, Michigan. The successful completion of these undertakings spurred Clerg to greater efforts. He proposed the building of a two and a half million dollar pulp mill for the American Sioux. Clerg at this time moved from his blockhouse. He built Montfermier, a massive dwelling which overlooked the city. All seemed rosy at the turn of the century for Clerg and his consolidated Lake Superior Company. By 1902, there was no looking back for the prosperous town of Sault Ste. Marie. With uncanny insight, this one man reached out, seeing the unleashed powers of Sault Ste. Marie and took them in his hand. Yet, he called himself simply a backwoodsman from the wilds of Algoma. Nineteen o two, the year that began so well and saw so much accomplished, ended badly. The steel plant still wasn't completed and had to close down in December for lack of orders. Orders that Clerk had counted on to supply him with the cash needed to carry on. Now, after spending over twenty-seven and a half million dollars on the various industries, the company had to float alone. In January nineteen three, a New York financial house put up a three and a half million dollar six-month loan. Two months later, they advanced another one and three quarter million dollars, but only on the condition that Clerg be removed from any active management of the company. A new president and general manager was appointed, and Clerg was relegated to an advisory capacity only. The loans were extended a further six months when they became due on July 1st, 1903, but it was too little too late. The creditors were becoming impatient and there were rumblings of anger in the bush camps when the payroll didn't arrive on time. Monday, September 28, 1903. 300 men walked 24 miles down the railroad tracks into Sault Ste. Marie. Their rail cars had been left overnight out of the Sioux to keep them out of town. It was the outbreak of the first and what was remembered as the most devastating riot in Sault Ste. Marie. The 400-odd woodsmen surged in front of the main offices of the Clerg Company, hurling sticks, large rocks, bent on destruction. The general office was wrecked by the mob. There were threats of burning the International Hotel, threats of smashing the three coaches filled with men up the Algoma Central Railway unless they were brought into town. Women employees were moved onto the freighter Mini M and brought to the International Hotel for protection. The ferry service was suspended and docked on the American side of the river. Some streetcars were vandalized, others were put for safekeeping into their barns. Plummer's store was burglarized overnight and several firearms and ammunition stolen from the store. At one point, as the anger seethed through the crowd, shots were fired, injuring two men involved in the dispute. R.M. Wise, a young man of 24, quelled the rioters. He moved through the crowd, urging men to the local pubs. Meanwhile, company officials were taking action. Midnight, Tuesday night, September 29th, 50 men of the Royal Canadian Regiment arrived on a special train together with 34 of the Royal Canadian Dragoons mounted troops. Nine o'clock, Wednesday morning, September 30th, more troops from Ottawa. 362 men involving troops of Highlanders, Grenadiers, the militia from Toronto, Ottawa, Thessalon, and Sault Ste. Marie patrolled the city streets. 
75 loggers were given rooms on the top floor of the International Hotel to prevent its burning, while the Tagona Inn, another company hotel, hosted 250 woodsmen providing free food and accommodations. The company owed the men some $300,000 in back wages. The men were without money even to feed their families, and they wanted pay fast. The company was also in debt some $500,000 for railroad construction, with a further $700,000 due other creditors. The riot was heated, and distorted reports filtered throughout the southern region of Ontario, resulting in far more men being sent to the Sioux than needed. According to one member of the Toronto Highlanders, it was like this. By the time we left Toronto, the Sioux was in flames. By the time we got to Gravenhurst, there were 10 people killed here. And when we got to Sudbury, we were prepared to use bayonets. However, prompt action by the Ontario government brought the rioters to a halt and quieted creditors. Ten men were arrested and charged. The government ordered the local banks to pay the workers and hold the amount due against the consolidated Lake Superior Company in the form of land grants. The money was not immediately forthcoming, but the men returned to work, and one week later, the women employees were back on the job. It was the beginning of many years of struggle for the Sioux. The 1902 boom seemed remote in the wake of the 1903 riot. Only one day, and yet it had lasting effects. The results were lost or stagnant markets, unpaid workers, indebtedness of over $5 million, but even worse, shattered confidence and broken dreams, enough to set the Sioux back almost as much as it had advanced in the short eight years. But now that the riot was over and the last rocks had been thrown, the real battle began, the battle for control of the consolidated Lake Superior Company and its vast properties. Clerg and his supporters presented their plan for reorganization, but they were defeated, and so ended Clerg's association with the industries he had built. The group of investors who succeeded in gaining control of the company were not Clerg fans, which probably explains why Clerg is really a forgotten man in the city he built. For several more years, Clerg was a sometime resident of the Sioux, but shortly after the death of his father at Montfermier, the big house was sold. The Clerg connection ended in 1911, and although he did retain a few financial interests in the Sioux, only occasionally did he visit his town. Sault Ste. Marie acknowledged Clerg's efforts in 1937 with a testimonial banquet in his honor, at which time his portrait was presented to the corporation of the city of Sault Ste. Marie. The city he built. <laughs>